Welcome. I've worked with this um, engineering research e symposium presentation. Uh, this is part of a series of online presentations that highlights some of the excellent work being done by our research partners using our technologies. Before we go into today's presentation, I'd like to provide a quick introduction to MapleSoft, why we think it's important to support projects such as these and, and how we do that. Uh, Maple has, MapleSoft has over 30 years of experience in supporting advanced research projects. In fact, the company's core symbolic te technology, the, the ability to allow computers to handle problems at the equation level instead of attempting to solve them pu pu purely numerically, was developed as part of a research project in 1980 at the University of Waterloo in Ontario. Since then, many of our highly advanced computational technologies for solving complex analytical problems have had their beginnings in many of the research projects that we've been involved in. Uh, the MapleSoft was founded in 1988 to commercialize these technologies through the development uh, of the popular mathematics tool Maple and our powerful multi-domain engineering simulation tool MapleSim. MapleSoft is now a leading provider of high-performance tools and technologies for solving a myriad of technical problems in engineering, science, and applied mathematics uh, throughout the world. Uh, so, um, uh, software and services touches hundreds and thousands of people worldwide, and we are well known for our expertise in mathematical and system level modeling and analysis. We acknowledge that we can only advance through the support of uh, this engineering research projects that require our technologies and have been recognized as a powerful partner in these endeavor endeavors. Specifically, we can provide guidance and support in the development of research proposals through in-kind and technology contributions, as well as helping to foster relationships with our other industrial partners. Furthermore, we can provide help in skills development of your team members through training and application development support, as well as providing openings for core placements and internships. We also Uh, we also recognize that working with our research partners provides a very rich team of talent that is much needed by ourselves and our industrial partners. Consequently, we have, we've hired many engineers to work within our development and support groups and open up opportunities for new hires within our customers and our partners. So with that, I'd like to uh, pass the, um, uh, the, uh, the ball over to, uh, to our guest, uh, Will McNally. Uh, while we're doing that, I'll give you a bit of an introduction to him. Uh, so, uh, Will has gradu graduated from Memorial University at Newfoundland with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering in 2015. In the cooperative program, Will accumulated two years of work experience designing mechanical systems for commercial buildings. Now a master's student in the, in the systems design engineering department at the University of Waterloo, Will is dealing with a different kind. Of, it's really dealing with a very different kind of system, the golf swing. Fittingly, Will is also a member of the University of Waterloo's varsity golf team and has been playing golf competitively, competitively, and has been playing golf competitively for over 10 years. His research leverages multi-body dynamic simulation software such as MapleSim to simulate the biomechanics of the golfer and optimize golf equipment. He's currently applying his research via an internship at Ping, a golf equipment company headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona. He will return to his academic research in May and plans to submit his master's thesis by the end of 2017. So with that, I'd like to uh, pass, the, uh, pass it over to Will. Great. Thank you very much, Paul, for that great introduction. Um, so as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about my golfer model, uh, which I've been developing in MapleSim. Um, and um, first, I'd like to thank MapleSoft uh, for providing me the opportunity uh, to share this model with the MapleSim community. I think it's a really great application of MapleSim um, and a very unique one. Uh, so let's get started. I'll just start with a very high level, high level overview of the model. Um, so the full model includes uh, a MapleSim model and some MATLAB code, and it can be sort of subdivided into four main parts. Uh, so first we have the biomechanics of the golfer. Uh, we have a golf club, which includes a flexible shaft. Uh, we have an impact model, and uh, finally a ball trajectory model. So the biomechanics and the flexible club together make up the multi-body system, which we model in MapleSim. And then we have these biomechanical torques, which actuate the system, uh, simulating the golf swing. So here's what the visualization of the golf swing looks like in MapleSim. Unfortunately, we have no visualization tools uh, for the shaft, but it's really not hard to imagine its behavior. Uh, so then we take that MapleSim golf swing and we ex it is fully parameterized and we export it to MATLAB 
usually as an S function using MapleZoom Connector. Um, and here we pair it up with an impact model and a ball trajectory model, um, and then by maximizing a weighted carry value, uh, so the carry of a golf shot is, or of a golf drive, is equal to the distance the golf ball flies in the air. Uh, so by maximizing a weighted carry value, which is our objective function, any component of the golf swing can be optimized. Uh, so for example, we could optimize uh, the biomechanics of the golfer or the, uh, the club properties to improve performance. Uh, so now let's go into each of the model parts in a little bit more detail. Uh, so starting with biomechanics, uh, the biomechanics is made up of four rigid body segments connected by a series of revolute joints. Uh, so we have the pelvis, the torso, the leading arm, uh, and the hand. Um, and the center of the pelvis and the top of the torso, or the sternum, are fixed in space. And they're connected by a universal joint, which allows them to each rotate about their own longitudinal axes. Uh, and this is the kind of motion that you need to uh, replicate the kinematics of, of an actual golf swing. So a great part about this model, um, this biomechanical model, is that these body segments are scalable. These body segment mass properties, such as the center of mass location and the inertia matrices, are automatically generated. So the golfer has uh, six degrees of freedom. Um, so we have the rotation of the pelvis. Uh, we have the rotation of the torso. Uh, the shoulder joint has two degrees of freedom, so the arm can move in the horizontal and vertical planes. Uh, we have the supination of the forearm. Um, and then finally, we have the radial and ulnar deviation of the wrist. Um, so each of these degrees of freedom uh, is actually represented by one single revolute joint um, in, in the model itself. And these joints are actuated by uh, what we call our active muscle torques, which are our uh, custom biomechanical torque generators. And we also have our passive joint torques. Um, and these passive joint torques provide resistive torques near the joint limits. So an example of a passive torque uh, would be when the golfer is at the top of its backswing, as shown in this figure, um, and the shoulder joint is sort of reaching its, its range of motion. Well, at that point, um, there's going to be a resistive torque that's going to want to push the golfer's arm back towards the ground. Uh, so that's just an example of the passive joint torque. Um, and the, the torques that actually uh, move the system are equal to the sum of our active muscle torques and our passive joint torques. So just looking at these body segments a little bit closer. Uh, so as I said, uh, the segment lengths and the masses are calculated as a fraction of the golfer's overall height and mass. Uh, and these fractions are based on statistical means from a cadaver study. And then similarly, the rest of the mass property, so the center of mass location um, and three axes radii of gyration are also um, given as a fraction of this, the, the segment length. Um, and again, these are uh, means from, from the cadaver study. Uh, so here are the equations uh, which are used to uh, generate our active muscle torques. Um, they're based on biomechanical theory, um, and they're a function of time and angular, relative angular velocity of the joint. Uh, so basically, we tell the model when we want to uh, turn on these active muscle torques, and the torque uh, ramps up to some nominal value, um, and then we tell the model when we want to turn off the torque, and it ramps back down. And the shape it makes uh, somewhat resembles the experimental muscle activation curves uh, of real muscles. Um, and again, this, this torque is uh, uh, eventually scaled by the angular, relative angular velocity of the joint, and that's something that's, again, based on biomechanical theory. Uh, so here's the equation for our passive joint torques. Um, unlike our active muscle torques, these passive joint torques are based directly on experimental measurements. So here we have these red X's, which represent uh, resistive torque measurements uh, for the shoulder joint um, for its range of motion in the horizontal plane. Um, so what we do is we take this equation and we use um, a MATLAB, MATLAB's nonlinear fit function uh, to tune these um, coefficients, which will give us the best nonlinear function to fit this experimental data. And these passive joint torques are applied to uh, all the joints. So this is what a typical joint looks like in MapleSim. 
Um, so we have a revolute joint connecting two body segments. Um, we have time. Time is an input to the model. Um, it feeds into our active muscle torques. Uh, we have a relative rotation sensor, which is providing relative angular velocity of the joint to the active muscle torque. And then we can calculate our torque and apply it to the joint. Uh, and for the passive joint torque, we're just sensing the angle of the joint, uh, which feeds into our passive torque, torque equations. Um, and again, this torque is just applied to the joint. Uh, so that pretty much covers all the biomechanics of, of, of this model. Uh, now let's talk about the second part of the model, which is the flexible club. Uh, so for the shaft material properties, we have uh, experimental stiffness profiles for four different golf shafts. Uh, so the experimental stiffness profiles for uh, bending stiffness and torsional stiffness are represented here, uh, and they're plotted uh, from the tip end of, of the shaft to the butt end of the shaft. Uh, so what we do is we um, use sixth-order polynomials to fit the shaft properties, so the area, Young's modulus, area moment of inertia, and the shear modulus. And then in MapleSim, we use the standard flexible beam component and we input the material properties as functions of the flexible beam's x component, or as a function of its length, using these polynomial co coefficients. So here we're defining the area of the shaft. Um, so we have a1, a2, a3, a4, etc. These are the coefficients of our polynomial fits, uh, which are very good fits, by the way. Um, and they're multiplied, and they're a function of uh, the, the flexible beam's x component. So MapleSim 26, in the MapleSim 2016.2 release, uh, they provided this new feature where you could define uh, the flexible beam's material properties in discrete uh, shaft sections. So I wanted to compare this polynomial method uh, with 11 discrete sections, and I found that the polynomials um, really outperformed 11 sections, where the 11 sections sort of provided these extreme deflections which weren't really, really realistic. And here I have this photo to sort of illustrate the importance of uh, the flexible shaft in the golf swing. Uh, so not only does it create a whipping motion which adds club head speed, but at the time of impact it, there's also this lead deflection which you can see in this photo. Um, and this actually adds loft to the club head um, which ultimately uh, creates a higher launch angle for the golf ball and gets you more distance. Uh, so that is basically the full Mapleson model, and I just wanted to show again what this looks like. Okay, so now let's assume that we've exported the model. Um, now we pair it up with an impact model. And this impact model is based on impulse and momentum, uh, and with that we need to make a few assumptions. So one, we assume that it's an instantaneous impact, whereas in reality impact lasts for about half a millisecond. Um, two, uh, we're assuming that it's a free body collision uh, between a rigid club head and ball, uh, so the contact is occurring at a point rather than over a deformed surface. Uh, and three, we assume that the ball is rolling on the club face at the time of separation. Uh, so there's 15 unknowns in this system. We're solving for the linear and angular velocities of the club head and ball and an impulse. And these are all 3D vectors. So we're going to need 15 equations to solve uh, this system. So we get 12 equations from the conservation of momentum, uh, of conservation of linear and angular momentum of both the club head and ball. And then we need three more equations. So we can use the coefficient of restitution, or COR, in the rolling condition to relate the final ball velocity to the final club head velocity. So the coefficient restitution is equal to the final ball velocity minus the final club head velocity divided by the initial club head velocity. And the governing bodies of golf actually limit the COR of a club head to 0 0.83. So in this model, we set the COR to 0 0.83. And uh, for the rolling condition, also known as stiction or the gear effect, uh, we're essentially equating the ball velocity to the club head velocity um, in the tangential directions. And I have these apostrophes here to note that uh, these velocities are actually taken at the point of impact, which is a really important part because uh, say you have your club head velocity 
Well, it actually has an angular velocity, so the velocity at the point of impact is going to be much different than the velocity at the center of gravity of the club. Uh, so that's a very important aspect of this impact model. Uh, so next we have our ball trajectory model. Um, it's an aerodynamic model uh, published by Steve Quintavalla, who's a researcher at the United States Golf Association. Uh, so we have these coefficients for uh, drag, lift, and spin decay, which are uh, were empirically determined. Um, and then we use those coefficients in the forces, in the drag force, lift force, and then this moment force. Uh, and essentially, we use uh, an ODE solver to integrate these forces, uh, which are acting on the ball. And what we end up with is a ball trajectory that looks something like this. Okay, so how do we control and optimize the golf swing? Um, so again, this model is exported to MATLAB. Um, for a simple biomechanical optimization, the inputs to the optimization would be uh, your muscle torque timing, so your T-ons and your T-offs for each joint. Um, and then your output would be your carry distance and your deviation, or the offline distance from the center of the fairway. And then using MATLAB's global, optim global, global optimization toolbox, we can maximize uh, a weighted carry objective function. Uh, so here, our objective function, M, is equal to the actual carry minus this function, which is uh, related to the deviation from the center of the, fair of the fairway. So basically, this objective function penalizes shots that, are, uh, that have a large deviation. So let's just take a look, of, uh, take a look at a simple biomechanical optimization. So we have these initial guesses for the torque timings, and I, I came about these uh, torque timings uh, basically by self-tuning uh, the Mapleson model until uh, I found something that resembled an actual golf swing. Uh, so for this particular swing with these torque timings, uh, we got an adjusted carry value of approximately 240 yards. And then we perform a pattern search optimization so a pattern search is, is a function in MATLAB's global optimization toolbox that basically uses brute force to uh, test a bunch of different combinations of, of optimization variables. So it basically does trial and error with all these uh, T-ons and T-offs until it, it finds a combination that provides, uh, that minimizes or maximizes an objective function. So after this optimization process, we end up with an adjusted carry value of 230 yards. Or sorry, 263 yards. So we, we gained over 20 yards after the optimization. So then what you can do um, is incorporate some of the club head properties into uh, the biomechanical optimization. So for example, the default club head mass is 200 grams. So we take that previously optimized swing, uh, which used a 200 gram club head, but now we allow the club head to vary, the club head mass to vary as well. Um, and what we see is that not only do we find a different club, a different optimal club head mass, but we also see that all these torque timings are changing. So that's really where the power of this model lies. Um, so typically when, when you want to um, optimize a, a club property, the logic is that if the golfer swings in the same way, um, with these club head properties, then you'll see this amount of improvement. Um, but that might not necessarily be the case because if the, if the club head property is changed, then that might alter the golfer's swing. Uh, so this model is really powerful in that it can actually, uh, the golfer can adjust to these different club properties and still get the best swing. Um, so in this case, our, uh, our optimal club head mass of 170 grams actually only increased our carry distance by two yards. Um, but really this isn't a practical example of, of a club head property optimization because you can't, really, um, you can't really change the mass of a club head without uh, changing its MOI or its CG location. Uh, so I was just using this as an example of a club head property optimization. Uh, so that pretty much sums up uh, the golfer model as it currently stands. Um, my current focus, though, has been on validating the impact model and looking at alternative impact models. 
So if we're going to use uh, this model for optimization, uh, the impact model really needs to be a simple calculation and pretty robust. Uh, so the current model uh, is just that. It, it's very efficient, except it's not yet thoroughly validated. In our initial validation, uh, experiments are showing that it's, it's lacking in some aspects. So I've been looking to an alternative impact model, which is based on volumetric contact. Uh, and this model is a little higher fidelity. Um, it's, for one, it's, it's a transient model <clears throat> rather than being instantaneous. Uh, so because it's transient, that means we can model it in MapleSim, which would be a huge bonus. So let's talk a little bit more about this new alternative impact model. Um, so the normal force is based on sphere-sphere volumetric contact. And the club face geometry um, is approximated as being spherical. Um, and in general, this is uh, true from a club head design standpoint. Um, so the normal force is proportional to the penetration volume between the club face and the golf ball. Um, and then what we can do is we can tune the volumetric stiffness factor and the damping cut factor in order to match up the model's speeds with uh, what we're seeing in experiments. Um, and for this model's friction, we're using a continu continuous velocity-based friction, which was recently published by a colleague in our research group at the University of Waterloo. Um, and it's a function of the normal force and the relative velocity between the two bodies. And the friction constants, uh, there's three of them, uh, can be tuned, in our case, to match uh, experimental spin rates of the golf ball in the launch angle. Another very important aspect of this model is that we can actually capture the torsional compliance of the golf ball. Um, so during impact, uh, the core of the golf ball will sort of coil and uncoil, uh, and this causes a, a reversal in the, uh, in the friction force on the club face. So I can play this video, and here we can see the reversal of that friction force. And we capture this by modeling the golf ball as having multiple layers connected by um, torsional springs and dampers. Um, and this is a very, very important aspect of a golf impact because that, uh, that reversal of the friction force, so the friction at the end that's going the other way, um, actually reduces the amount of backspin on the ball and increases the launch angle. And from a club head design standpoint, those are the two main things that you're trying to achieve uh, because the ball flies furthest when you have a low spin rate and a high launch angle. Um, so another great part about this uh, volumetric model is that you can um, attach the flexible shaft to it. Uh, so I'm going to open up MapleSim and show you what this looks like. So here we have our sphere-sphere contact model um, in combination with our flexible shaft. And this flexible shaft is rotating about a revolute joint at the butt end of the shaft. Uh, and the, the axis of the revolute joint is perpendicular uh, to the shaft axis. So let's take a look at it and see what the simulation looks like. So if we look at the simulation on the top view, we can see that because the impact is occurring near the toe end of the club, the club ends up twisting a lot. So now, if we change the impact location to one inch towards the heel of the club and run the simulation, which should only take a few seconds. So now the impact location is occurring on the heel of the club. And now we don't see very much twisting of the club head at all. Um, so this asymmetry 
might cause you to think that maybe the shaft um, could possibly influence the impact. Uh, so that's just another example of how MapleSim can capture this complex phenomenon. Um, and this would be one of the primary examples of how this model outperforms our original impulse momentum model. And with that, uh, I think that pretty much wraps up my presentation for today. Uh, so I'll send it back over to Paul. Many thanks, Will. So, very interesting, powerful uh, example of the use of, the, of our tools. Um, I'm just going to wrap up, and uh, then we'll have a, a bit more of a Q&A um, uh, in a moment. Uh, if I can just get my presentation up. There we go. So just to, to wrap up, um, I, I want to provide a, uh, just a, an in, you know a sort of uh, something of an introduction to the tools that are being used um, in the in this project. Um, so you know, we'll start with uh, MapleSim, is our uh, multi-domain system level simulation tool, that allows you to build models of complex uh, dynamic systems by selecting and connecting components from a large library of pre-built components covering a variety of domains like mechanical, multi-body, as we've seen in, uh, in Will's uh, example, control, uh, controllers, thermal, electromagnetics, and, um, and hydraulics. Uh, we also offer specialized libraries for batteries, uh, drive lines, and transmissions, tires, advanced hydraulics, and pneumatics. So it's important to note that unlike traditional tools like uh, Simulink, connections between the components represent the physical connections and not just the signals flowing in, um, in one direction or another. This greatly simplifies the modeling task and dramatically reduces the complexity of the resulting block diagram. Uh, Maple is our interactive environment for mathematical analysis and design exploration, uh, and you can use this tool to uh, perform uh, many different uh, anal analyses. Uh, there are over 5,000 mathematical functions that are ready to tackle problems like parameter tuning, optimization, Monte Carlo analysis, uh, sensitivity analysis, vibration analysis, and systems uh, linearization. A full programming language allows you to script um, and automate the analysis ta tasks, but also allows you to de define custom uh, modeling components from first principles that can be then brought back into the MapleZoom environment. Um, I'll probably ask you a bit more about that uh, in our Q&A, Will. Uh, the Maple document interface allows you to easily capture every step you take, and the resulting interactive documents are easy to share, review, validate, and reuse throughout your, your product design or um, within your PLM systems. In all, Maple provides you with a rich and powerful environment for design exploration and capturing the knowledge behind it. System level models are an essential ingredient in verifying and validating a design. Uh, these models can be deployed to a real-time environment. Um, and these can be connected with a controller or sensor hardware or, um, um, or used within uh, further analysis tools like MATLAB Simulink um, for, for, for further um, uh, analysis in, in, in this particular case, uh, the optimization of the, um, uh, of the, the, the swing design. Um, Really, uh, unique to us is that the ability to ex generate extremely fast simulation code, which gives you a lot of flexibility to use uh, for, for, uh, for more de detail, detailed models to meet um, real-time constraints or execution constraints. Um, finally, the um, uh, we'd, um, we'll talk about the, uh, the, the generating Simulink S functions. We also support the uh, uh, functional mockup interface, or FMI, which is now becoming an industry standard uh, for um, uh, opening up additional opportunities for integration with a growing range of supported tools within your tool chain. Uh, Maple and MapleSim are very powerful tools and enable a um, model development innovation process in your engineering research work. Um, and this just gives us a summary of the uh, what's available to you, uh, not just Maple and Maple Sim, but all the various add-ons that allow you to get to get to where you need to go uh, with your uh, with your projects. And effectively, to make your your, uh, your project successful, to do more with less time, reduce project risk, risk, and produce better better results, uh, more rigorous results um, uh, as a result.